All right, I'll just give people a few seconds to join us. Awesome, awesome. All right, so it's been a minute, so I will get us started. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you are well, and I am so glad that you are joining us today. Thank you. Um, the Spina Bifida Association and the Spina Bifida Association of Northeastern New York are hosting our second webinar in the education series, Taking Charge of My Learning in the Virtual Platform. My name is Julia Duff. I am the Executive Director of the Spina Bifida Association of Northeastern New York, and I will be facilitating today's webinar. And I am joined by Julie Indra. She will be presenting the information and responding to your questions. Julie has over 20 years of experience working in education and is currently the Director of Student Access Services at Hofstra University. So Julie will be presenting a wealth of information and resources, so please submit your questions and answers. There is a Q&A button that you can click to submit. We will not be able to see comments, so if you have questions, comments, concerns, please submit them there. We will be answering all of your questions live at the end of this webinar, and any we don't get to, we will do our best to respond to, and it will be uploaded to the Spina Bifida Association's Spina Bifida and COVID-19 resource page, and that link will also be available at the end of this webinar. So that's questions and answers. Um, great, so today's webinar comes as a result of a nationally recognized need to provide support to parents and students in the Spina Bifida community in regards to at-home and virtual learning. So Julie, the Spina Bifida Association, and myself at the Spina Bifida Association of Northeastern New York decided to collaborate and offer two webinars, and tonight is aimed for high school and college level students. Julie will be discussing what online learning looks like, typical learning profiles of students with Spina Bifida, the positive and negative impacts of learning at home, understanding your rights under the IDEA and ADA regulations, and tips and strategies for being productive and successful in this new normal. So I'll pass the mic to Julie, who will get us started. Thanks, Julia. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about a subject um, in about 45 minutes that I could spend the day on. So uh, bear with me. I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground and answer people's questions. but. Before I start, I also want to say that some questions are complicated. Um, and 
if your question requires more than just a quick response here in this forum, uh, certainly I want to encourage you to reach out to me. We can have a dialogue, we can exchange emails, um, we can get deeper into some of the concerns that you raised. But so tonight is really just a, an overview. Um, and what, where I want to start is sort of what, what is online learning? Um, online learning can be in one of two possible formats, synchronous or asynchronous. Synchronous uh, is when you are in a classroom that is virtual via Zoom or one of the other uh, classroom platforms that are being used, and you're in a classroom with your professor or your teacher at a specific time for a specific duration, and the teaching and learning is happening within a specific time frame. Asynchronous courses are when a teacher or a, a faculty member sends you through some platform like Blackboard or Moodle, um, assignments, things to do, and then gives you a deadline and tells you to do those things, interact with the material, and then post them back to the professor or to the teacher to be reviewed later. So what I find that is happening in most high school and college uh, level courses at this point is usually a mix between those two things. There's some online real-time interaction and some stuff that we have to do independently on our own time within uh, the constraints of a, a deadline prescribed by a teacher or a professor. Um, what are some of the common platforms that we are using? I mentioned a couple of them. Zoom, Micro Microsoft Teams, Google Classroom, Moodle, Blackboard. All of those are platforms that allow some mixture of real-time interaction uh, and asynchronous uh, coursework of some type. Next slide, please. So the other thing that we have to look at and think about as we figure out how to navigate this strange environment that we find ourselves in now is who are we as learners? Um, and before I go through the next two slides, I want to say that I have a disclaimer. And my disclaimer is all of us with spina bifida are different. We all have different talents and abilities and challenges. But as an aggregate population, we all can, when we get together, find some common ground and some things that we, that most of us, feel is an impediment to our learning uh, and, and some things that we all share as gifts. And one of my gifts that I share with lots of people with spina bifida is one that I'm exercising right now. I'm talking. <laughs> and lots of us are very verbal and social learners. And we're good at learning by talking, asking questions, listening to people talk and interacting in a social setting. So therefore, sitting at home in our room at our desk in front of a computer is not necessarily the ideal way for us to learn. Um, we also, many of us have deficits in attention and focus. Um, this can be exacerbated by the environment that we find ourselves in now, which is much more passive than interacting uh, in a classroom. You're sitting, staring at a screen, reading, writing, and it sort of makes it much more difficult for those of us who already have challenges with attention and focus um, to, do what we, to do what we need to do. Next slide, please. And here's the big one, that although there are exceptions, most of the folks, and I've been, you know, um, in the spina bifida community, I've been talking to people, other people with spina bifida my whole life. Um, and most of us will acknowledge that we share 
some significant challenges and deficits in the area of executive function. And what do I mean by executive function? So executive function, the way I like to describe it is executive function is the little voice in the back of your mind that is your mental secretary, your automatic reminder, your reminder that you have a paper due in three days and you better get on it, your um, voice in the back of your head that says, I am not going to finish this in time unless I get it, you know, unless I get started. Um, this is the voice that helps us to plan tasks. Most of us don't sit down and write a 25 page research paper or a 10 page research paper for that matter in an evening, right? We have to break it down into pieces and chunks and, and uh, have steps uh, and see, and the steps have to be sequential. Um, and this person that has executive function challenges might have more difficulty figuring out how do I break that down into steps? What are the steps? What should I do first and second and third? And how long should step one take me? How long might step two take me? And so we run into problems with planning, especially those long-term tasks, initiating tasks. Many of us have trouble starting. We will sit in front of a blank notebook or a blank screen for the longest time because we don't know how to start doing what we need to do. Once we get started, we're off and running and we can do it, but oftentimes we have a difficult time starting. Uh, managing our time. How many of you have had a situation where you sit down and start doing something that you think you're going to be able to get done before dinner and all of a sudden three hours goes by and you're like, wow, I didn't think it was going to take me that long. So in order for us to be effective learners in high school or college in the online environment, we have to get better at guesstimating. How long in my schedule of my day should I set aside for this task and that task? We have to practice doing that, right? We're not good guesstimators. In general, we're not good guesstimators, uh, which also uh, presents problems for a lot of us in mathematics, because in math, we might sit down and do a problem and get to the answer and not have the same voice in our head that tells us that we got the wrong answer because it doesn't look right because we can't guesstimate what the answer should be, right? So that's all sort of related. Organizing space. Uh, my desk is a mess. Only I can make sense of my mess, but I have learned over time that I can function in what I call organized chaos, right? The piles of stuff on my desk look like insanity to most people. In fact, I, I joke about this all the time. I have seven people working for me. And when I go on vacation and leave my office, I have to stop before I leave and say to my staff, do not touch my desk because they want to help me and they feel compelled when I'm away to go in there and clean off my desk and organize everything. But the problem is if they do that, I'm not, I'm, when I come back to work, I'm not going to know where anything is. So I tell them, I have to tell them, don't touch my desk, but we have to at least be able to create our own organized chaos. It doesn't have to make sense to other people. It doesn't have to make sense to mom and dad, but it has to make sense to you because if you have unorganized chaos, you're going to spend way too much of your productive time looking for stuff. And we don't want that. We want your time to be productive. The other aspect of executive function that a lot of us have trouble with is what I call evaluating self-efficacy, evaluating how well something is working. Time after time, I work with students who sit down and they're motivated and they, they intently, they, they're going to read a chapter in their history book and they sit down and they sit there for an hour and they read it and they go through it. And it never occurs to them during the hour that they spend reading 
that what they're doing isn't working and that the information isn't sinking in. So they've killed an hour doing something that is not effective, right? So because they don't know that they don't have that voice in their head that says, this isn't working, I better do something different, right? So sometimes we have to check ourselves. And after 10 minutes of reading say, did that work? Did I get it? What did I get from that? Do I have to do something different? Problem solving and flexibility. Well, <laughs> here comes COVID-19. We, many of us will learn how to function adequately in an environment where we have some sense of order and some sense of what is the pattern, right? What is expected? What does my day look like? When do I have math class versus when do I have my composition class? When are my quizzes in history class? And then all of a sudden, if somebody throws a wrench in it, we don't, we, we have a really difficult time saying, wait, 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 you change the rules. You can't do that, right? So we have, we have to pay some attention to the fact that adjusting and being flexible does not necessarily come naturally to us. We need to work at it. We need to be aware that it's a problem and we need to set aside time and effort to work on how can I adjust to this new thing, right? So we have to allow ourselves a little time so that we can figure out everything has changed. The ball game has changed now. What do I need to do differently? And that's gonna take a lot of us a little bit of time. So cut yourself some slack and give yourself a break if it does take you time uh, to adjust when everything suddenly changes. Next slide, please. Okay, so briefly, just because you're home and learning at home doesn't mean that the stuff that you were entitled to in school is no longer valid, right? If you are in high school and you were receiving any kind of special education services, whether it might have been um, a team teaching model where there were two teachers and someone there to help you um, with something you were struggling with or whether you had a resource room that you went to a couple of times a week or whether you got accommodations like extra time on tests and a separate setting for exams or notes from the teacher or professor or whatever that looked like, um, you are still entitled to those things in the home learning environment. And if you're not getting the accommodations that you feel were in place when you were in a school classroom, you need to speak to your teachers or your professors. Uh, and if you're in college, the person who does what I do, which is I run the disability services office, student access services. If you feel that if you're a college student and you're at home and your professors are not providing you with the accommodations that your college approved, you need to contact the accessibility or disability services office and say, I'm not getting my accommodations in my online learning environment because what I'm doing right now at Hofstra from my living room couch is making sure that all of my students are getting from their professors in their online courses, the accommodations that they are entitled to. They may look different in the home online learning environment, but you still should be having a dialogue with your teachers or your professors about how do I get the, the adjustments that make it a level playing field for me. You need to feel comfortable reaching out to people and engaging in that dialogue and making sure that you're getting the support that you need in order to be successful. Next slide, please. All right, so. Now we get to the fun part of the presentation, which is how in the world do I do this? Um, and many of you have been doing it for a month. Maybe you had to try a few things and fail at it and discover that some things didn't work and try something new um, and keep on you know, whacking at it until you find a process, until you find strategies and techniques that work for you. But the first, hint that I have for all of you, if you haven't figured this out already, is you have to act as if you are going to school. You have to act as if you're going to school in terms of how you deal with time, space, and attitude. 
right? So if you as a college student were going to class between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. every day and you were doing studying from four to seven or five to eight every day when you were in school outside the home, you need to replicate that when you're home. And, and I know that home is comfortable, home is distracting, there's all of us have a bazillion streaming channels and we have Xbox and we have all kinds of things to occupy our time. So I'm gonna tell you how I first learned about how important this act as if thing is. When I was in high school, my parents started, uh, they, they started a small business that they ran out of the basement of our home. Uh, and uh, it was a computer programming and, and computer uh, software consulting business. And I got up one morning and I was in the kitchen and my father came down uh, in his robe and made a cup of coffee. And then he went back upstairs. And a, a little while later, he came down, he had gone upstairs, he took a shower, he put on a suit and tie. And then he came down to the kitchen and he grabbed his keys and started walking out the door. I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to work. I said, dad, you work in the basement. He said, I'll be back. So he leaves, gets in his car, goes down the street to the coffee shop, gets breakfast and another cup of coffee, gets back in his car, drives back to the house, parks in the driveway, comes into the house, walks straight down into the basement. He has acted as if he was going to work as though he was going to an office. And that was his way of saying, I know that I'm not going to be able to give this my full attention if I'm in my sweatpants. I know that I'm not going to be able to give this my full attention if I'm stretched out laying on my bed with the news on the television in the background. So he acted as if he was going to school in terms of his space and his time. Now, an attitude also. Um, I've been working from home for the last six weeks. I get up, I have coffee, I take a shower, I get dressed as though I was going to work and I sit down, I have a space that I have designated, I sit down and my attitude changes when I am prepared as though I was outside of my home and interacting with other people. My attitude, I'm once that happens at 9 a.m., I'm in work mode. So next slide, please. Okay. So in terms of time, I briefly mentioned this uh, before. Create a schedule of daily activities and stick to it as best you can. Create a schedule of when do I have to be in class? When am I gonna do my homework? When am I gonna study? When am I gonna work on these other things that I have to work on? And make sure that you also schedule downtime, right? Don't feel like you have to sit in front of your computer. Plus, it's bad for you. It's bad for your vision. It's bad for you cognitively to sit in front of a screen for eight solid hours. Don't, don't do that. You have to schedule breaks, snacks, shift your activities. Don't spend an entire day working on one specific essay. Break it up into chunks. Work on that for a little while. Shift over to do some math homework. We know from research for decades that the mind functions better if you, if you shift activities on a regular basis and do something different. If you spend way too long on one specific task, your attention and your focus begins to wane. And, you know, and we've all been there. We all know what it's like after you get to that point where you're staring at the book, but you're no longer actually reading, right? So we want to prevent that. So what you want to do is you want to break up your day. And if you're just a, a guide, if you're in high school, you should be spending somewhere between five and six hours per day doing school work in 30 to 45 minute chunks, all right? So if you think about that, five to six hours a day, Think about your, if you're in high school, think about your high school day, what it typically looks like. 
in addition to a bunch of classes that usually last, what, 45, 50 minutes, right? You have um, uh, probably a, a physical education class. You probably have a lunch period. You may have a study hall. You may have extracurricular activity participation, creative arts kinds of things that you go to. So remember to schedule yourself in a way that would be fairly similar to if you were in your high school building. Now, if you're in college, this is what I always say to uh, my college students at Hofstra. You should be, if you're a full-time college student, you should be treating being a full-time college student like a full-time job, right? You're gonna work at going to college as though you were a full-time job. What's a full-time job? 40 hours a week, right? So, but, but still you want to, you want to schedule that with breaks and schedule it. Also, you know, if there's things that you need to do independently, like I need to write a paper, you can also do it at a time of day when you know that you're most on, when your brain is functioning at its best. Me personally, 7 a.m. is not my favorite time. It's not when my brain is working at its best. My brain is working at its best right about now. Right. So uh, I do my work in the evening, not too late, but I usually would do my work in the evening. Um, six to eight hours per day in 45 to 60 minute chunks. Um, the reason I say 45 to 60 minute chunks is to start taking charge of that self-regulation. If you are reading for 45 minutes, at the end of that 45 minutes, stop and digest and think and regurgitate. What did I read? What did it mean? What did I learn? What do I still want to know more about, right? You need to be able to start to use those breaks in between these study periods to do some self-evaluating, right? I spent 45 minutes underlining my history textbook. Did it benefit me? Did it help? I don't know. Think about it. If that didn't work, the next time you sit down to do history, try a different tactic. Try highlighting. Try stopping every few pages and writing down the most important points. Do a bunch of different things to try to help yourself figure out, was this time useful? Did I use it wisely? Did it work, right? Because we all learn from trial and error, right? We all learn by making mistakes. Everybody knows that the path to success is not a straight line. The path to success has peaks and valleys and ups and downs and twists and turns. And sometimes the lines are tied up in knots, right? We have to just keep trying things until it works. Next slide, please. All right, so space, okay? You need to have a designated space that says, when I am here, I am going to school, right? So it's not the same place where you watch videos. It's not the same place where you play with your Xbox. It's not the same place where you eat, right? You have a designated place that when you go there and sit at that space, you're going to school. And that's what that spot, that's what that space is for. And when you're not going to school, get up and leave that space to do something different, right? Obviously, you need comfortable seating and proper desk height and proper lighting. You need to make sure that you're not shortchanging yourself by um, having to sit in a, a place that's not comfortable for you or straining your eyes by not having uh, enough lighting. You need to make sure that you're creating a space that is conducive to learning. Everything that you might need, all of your academic materials need to be readily in. Do you know, those of us that are really good at wasting time can spend a good three or four hours wandering around our apartment looking for a stapler <laughs> or 
uh, looking for another pen because the pen dried out, or what did I do with those notes that I took the other day, right? You need to make sure that when you sit down in this designated space, in that space is everything you might need. Your computer, pens, highlighters, scratch paper, a calculator, whatever it is that you, your textbooks, right? Whatever it is that you need in that space needs to already be there so you don't spend uh, and waste a lot of time running around looking for stuff. Um, and the obvious, duh, <laughs> at the end of your uh, day of studying uh, and doing your schoolwork, you need to clear and organize your stuff uh, in that space and review, listen to this, this is important, and review what is coming tomorrow so that when you start tomorrow, you have fresh in your mind, this is my agenda, this is my to-do list, these are the things I need to accomplish today, this is what's coming. Because one of the things that scares us a lot is not knowing what's coming. So before you quit for the day and call it a day before you get, you know, go on to something else, make sure that you take a quick look at what's, what am I up against tomorrow? Next slide, please. Okay, this goes back to something I said a little bit ago when I was talking about services and accommodations. Use school and outside resources to the greatest extent possible. Bug the crap out of your teachers and your professors, out of your school administrators. If there's online tutoring available, use it as much as you can. Do anything to use the resources that are available to you instead of just sitting there and thinking you have to figure out how to do this yourself. Bug the crap out of the people that are there getting paid to serve you, okay? Um, communicate with school personnel, like I said. Your professor's office hours. All professors had office hours when you were on campus. They still have them now, contact them. Discuss what you're doing in school with those who are sheltering in place with you. Like I said, we're having to spend a lot of time learning independently and studying on our own. But in the beginning of this presentation, I said that we are social learners and we are verbal learners. So engage the people in your household by having a conversation with them about what you're doing in school. It's gonna help you I find sometimes just talking to someone else about the thing I have to do at work that's bothering me that I don't know how to do. Sometimes I, I find that just talking it through helps me figure out what I need to do and how I need to do it. So talk to your family or whoever else is in the household where you're sheltering in place about what's going on in school. Uh, also, explore your own online learning tools in your downtime. If you want to learn more about Zoom or learn more about Google Classroom or learn more about what's out there to help you with your executive function challenges, feel free to investigate those things, but don't do it during the five or six hours that you're supposed to be spending doing your studies, right? Do it in your downtime. Next slide, please. All right. This one's really, really important. Incorporate plenty of physical activity. When I say break up your tasks into 30 to 45 minute uh, time slots, in between those times, move, go whatever, go get a drink of water, do something, right? Move around, don't, don't sit still in that spot for too long. You gotta, you gotta incorporate some physical activity. If the weather is uh, permissible and if your neighborhood, if this is uh, permissible in your neighborhood, given your setting where you live, go outside for a little while every day. Get your juices flowing, get your blood flowing, do some physical exercise. When you're sitting in front of the TV, after you're done with your studies, you know, lift cans of tomatoes if you don't have weights, you know, get, though keep keep the blood flowing and keep the physical activity happening because you know time after you know, study after study after study for decades has proven that physical activity helps cognitive function right if i am too sedentary my brain starts to get lazy 
all right? Find ways to keep your creative juices flowing each day. Incorporate into your studies um, art, theater, music, whatever you want to do to entertain yourself, to keep, you know, if you draw or if you, uh, you know, I mean, I, I live in New York and one of the most devastating things for me um, when, uh, when everything started to shut down was I love Broadway. I love going to Broadway shows and I am in, I'm in Broadway um, withdrawal right now. I'm in Broadway withdrawal, and but I found online some sites that are, are streaming uh, videos of Broadway shows uh, for free uh, during the pandemic. So um, I use that to, you know, to lift my spirits a little bit and to entertain myself and keep the creative juices flowing. Next slide, please. All right, now it's time for Q&A. Awesome. Awesome. Um, just want to make sure that people's Q and A buttons are working. Um, if you could respond in that, that um, Q and A button just quickly and let us know that it's functioning. That'd be great. Um, we do have some questions, so I'll start there. <clears throat> so I think one of the common concerns is, you know, the balance of giving responsibility, taking accountability and do you have any suggestions to use this period in time to help improve self-sufficiency? Yes, definitely. I, I just finished saying, use your resources and talk to people. Um, Cause look, I'm gonna say something to you that was an important lesson for me to learn. Um, and I say it all the time, every chance I get to, to people with disabilities. Independence does not necessarily mean never having to ask anyone for help. In fact, part of my independence um, when I became an adult was learning how to use the resources available to me to make me more self-sufficient and more independent. What you have to think about is when you can't do something, instead of just going, hey, mom, or instead of just going, hey, teacher, I want you to think through where might I find the answer to this question? How might I learn from someone who has figured out how to do this? Ask a friend, ask a colleague. How would you do, not do this for me, but hey, when you went, ran into a problem in, in, with this issue, what did you do? How did you solve it? and learn from them. Um, you can use this time to become more independent. Uh, one of the things you can do, and if there's parents that are here with us, God bless you, that's wonderful. But I'm gonna tell you something right now that I'm, I'm, talking, to your, I'm talking to your kids. It's okay from time to time for you to say to mom and dad, you know what, don't worry about it, I got it. I'll handle it. Right. I know you care about me and I know you're checking up on me and I know that you're not sure that I'm getting my work done, but it's okay for you to back off. I got, I've, I've got it. I can do it. Right. Um, practice, practice doing that. And if there's parents on the line, practice accepting that practice stepping away. This is an opportunity for young adults to become more independent while they're close by. So give them what they ordinarily would and see what they do with it. They might surprise you. Great, and I, I do wanna pose out there too, you know, we are presenting information, but we all are also talking to experts who have lived experience. So if you guys have any suggestions and you know want to share that in the Q&A, what's kind of worked for you to study effectively, do that and we'll share that live now too. Um, all right, our next question. I heard people with spina bifida and hydrocephalus tend to have ADD or ADHD. What's your impression on this and how should we deal with it if we do? Uh, many students uh, that uh, many people with uh, spina bifida do have 
varying degrees of attention challenges. That it may not rise to the level of a diagnosable ADHD, but they still notice that they have trouble focusing and trouble paying attention for long periods of time. So here's a few tips and strategies. Don't force your brain to do something that it is not prepared to do. If you have trouble focusing on your history textbook, as an example, forcing yourself to sit there in front of it and stare at it isn't going to help. Because you might be staring at it, but nothing is getting through. What you have to do is find ways to use shorter spans of time that are more cognitively effective. Use shorter periods of time where your brain is able to digest material more effectively. Some strategies that I've had people use uh, in order to do that is, look, just because you're 17 years old or 18 years old or 19 or, or 57 like me, right? Um, doesn't mean that, that you're gonna be able to sit in front of something and stare at it and, and have your brain function for two hours while you're working on something that you need to do. Um, I have had people set their uh, timer on their phone for 10 minutes. Challenge yourself for that 10 minutes read and focus and study intently. And when the buzzer goes off, stop, look away, do something different for five minutes and then go back, right? Because look, if you figure out that your reading attention span is 10 minutes, that's okay. You have to schedule 30 of them to get your work done, but it's okay to do it in 30 10 minute slots with a break in between, rather than trying to force yourself to focus for an hour because if you know yourself well enough to know that, that ain't gonna work, right? And if it's not gonna work, let's do something different. Try to focus more intently for a, bit, for a shorter period of time. And, 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 and sooner or later, what you're gonna notice is that now you can set the timer for 15 minutes instead of 10 minutes. And then once you train your brain to do that, eventually you might get to 20 minutes and 25 minutes. But forcing once you're, once you're listening to the sound of the cars that are driving by outside, it's pointless to, to try to, to, you know, you have, you've got to realize that you got to get things done. Um, and, and it might mean if you're working in shorter periods of time that you're going to have a longer day. And you know what? Guess what? It is what it is. And if you, it takes you longer to do stuff, that's just one of the things that you're going to have to adjust to, that it just takes you longer. Great. Thank you, Julie. Um, so our next question, and I think, again, this is sort of a common secondary diagnosis that can impact our ability to focus and learn. So it has to do with anxiety. Um, in school, I've managed to have okay grades because I could have things physically in my hand like assignments. How do I deal with being fully online instead of having things in my hand? I have always used physical textbooks, but being online is stressing me out. Do you have any tips? So there's two things that play here. Um, I'm gonna, I, I don't know if you can see this, but I work at home and I'm, totally online. I'm in front of my laptop and I'm talking to people in Zoom meetings just like we're doing right now. Um, but I am a tactile print paper person. I have my notes that I'm taking and I have them. I, see, look, paper. It's okay for you to use those tools that make you feel like you have a better handle on it. If you need to be looking at a screen and you need to have a notebook where you're physically writing stuff down, do it, right? Make it as tactile as you possibly can if that's what makes you feel better. So that's the first thing. Um, but the other thing that's at play is the anxiety itself. What is the source of that? Why does it make you feel uncomfortable? Is it just because it's different? 
because it may turn out that it's not actually more difficult for you. Your anxiety is just telling you that it's going to be more difficult because it's different from what you're used to. You may be able to adjust to it, but anxiety is a very real thing. I work in a college setting with, a, with college students that have a tremendous amount of, many of them have a tremendous amount of anxiety and pressure around my grades. I got to get this grade to get my scholarship. I got to get a B on this exam in order to pass this class. One of the things that we do in the college setting for students with anxiety is we allow them accommodations like being to being able to be in a separate room and having extra time to take those exams because you know where the anxiety comes from the anxiety comes from thinking you're going to run out of time long before you ever run out of time your brain already telling you i'm going to run out of time once you're focused on the anxiety around that you're no longer focused on taking the test or or handling the task you're focused on your worry about what might happen in the future but what happens when we put students in a separate setting in a comfortable setting by themselves and give them extra time you know what the voice in the back of their head that tells them i'm worried that that i'm worried about running out of time stops talking to them and they're able to focus on taking the test and the anxiety so what you have to do is Find ways to surround yourself with things that make you comfortable. If it's pens and, and paper to write things down as you go, do it. If it's um, something, I, we also have a thing in our testing center is a great big bowl at the front desk when you first come in and it's filled with things to do to to uh to occupy your one of your hands while you're taking a test cush balls and stress balls and little stuffed animals and all kinds of things that you can have in your hands to manipulate while you're taking the test because a lot of people with a, a, uh, symptoms of adhd or symptoms of anxiety if we can find something to do with the fidgetiness we can redirect the brain function away from the fidgetiness and back to the task at hand. You know, in the old days, the old style of, of teaching was if you're not sitting perfectly still with your hands on the desk and staring at me, you're not paying attention. We know better now. Lots of students like us need to have something to do with their hands or some people need to listen to mu you know, um, instrumental music while they study these things what you want to do is you want to create this environment is different for you and it's worrying you and you get anxiety surround yourself with stuff that makes you comfortable surround yourself with the stuff that makes you feel like things are regular right like things are ordinary um and take it one little bit at a time here's the thing about anxiety every time successfully finish something or successfully do something that was giving you anxiety take a few minutes to congratulate yourself and say you know i was worried about not being able to do that but look i did it i was successful eventually the more success that you have it builds up your tolerance for the anxiety and the anxiety is no longer as debilitating as it used to be and you know that's just the beginning i'm not a I'm, I'm not a licensed clinical psychologist but i know enough about this to know that um this is a tough problem and there's not an easy answer but over time if you practice some of these coping skills it will get better great that was uh, really great, Julie. And we did get two responses to that. Um, one response is, I like being able to sort out my work in front of me. And if I don't, I can't focus. And then someone else said, totally agree with Julie. Yeah, sorting is good. I'm going to have this that I'm doing over here on the left, this that I'm doing over here on the right. They're all readily available, but I've sorted. The other thing is, you as a learner have to decide some people are better by doing the easy stuff first and leaving the hardest thing to last 
because they build up confidence and build up that you know tolerance for the anxiety by being successful at the easier things and they build up to the last thing however for some people it's the opposite they're afraid of the hard thing and putting it off just makes it worse and makes it worse you have to learn about you have to use this time to learn about yourself what makes you tick what makes you successful what helps you learn and what doesn't help you learn because I can sit here and give you tips and strategies until I'm blue in the face. But each one of you is different and you have to spend a little time thinking about, think about a time in the past when I did something that was difficult and was successful. How did I do it? What was my strategy? How did I feel when I got it done? You know, you have to, you have to, you have to think about those things and you have to, you have to figure out who you are as a learner because after you're done with school, who you are as a learner is going to inform who you are as an employee, as a worker. Absolutely. And, you know, it's just funny because I am a licensed social worker and I hear you talk about this. And my first thought was, you know, what's the trigger? Is the information overwhelming, the setting, and then knowing what your coping skills are and creating that setting where you thrive um, and you, you hit the nail on the head. So, amazing um and someone you know said what works for them is doing the thing that will take the most time first and that's you know to reiterate what you said really important knowing yourself knowing what's going to work best for you one of the things that increases motivation is a feeling of accomplishment the more you accomplish the more motivated you are to do more it's true. It's just a fact of human nature. Awesome. And we have another question. So what can we do as parents to most effectively support our youth with spina bifida to not lose ground while they're sheltered in place? Well, first, make sure that, as I had said in one of the previous slides, that five to six hours a day is spent in some way engaging with academic material, not necessarily math, you know, for six hours or whatever, but make sure that five to six hours a day is being, being spent interacting um, with academics in, in some, in some fashion. Uh, another thing is to, um, you're not going to like this either. <laughs> Set the expectations. This is what I expect of you. This is what's going to happen. If you are successful, this is what we're going to have to do if it's not working and then step away and let them do it. Um, I have said this to parents of people with spina bifida for 20 years. One of the greatest things my parents ever did for me was let me screw up. But don't let it go on too long, you know, let them screw up and then step in and say, so, that didn't go so well. What do you think went wrong? Why do you think you weren't successful in completing that task? What do you think needs to be done differently the next time? Have a conversation about it. Don't be judgmental about it, but have a conversation about, because you know, when, when I messed up, my parents didn't get on a plane and fly down to North Carolina and rescue me, but they did get me on the phone and say, so that didn't go so well, what are you gonna do now? And they engaged me in conversation that helped me develop problem solving skills. Um, but they didn't rescue me and they didn't fix it. Um, they talked me through how to fix it and how to learn from it. Um, so I think it's really important if your kids are teenagers to set the expectations for what are your expectations and have high expectations, right? I expect you to get decent grades in school. I expect you to, um, be able to attend all of your synchronous classes. I expect you to get passing grades in all of your classes. I, you know, set the expectations, but then leave them alone. Let them do it. And that speaks to, you know, another point that's come up is parents are busy. They're overwhelmed if they're working from home and it can be easy sometimes just to provide the answer or 
manage their time for them and uh, you know, how do you balance setting the expectation, teaching them problem solving skills and not having them sort of come back and rely on you for managing their time and their schedule? One more suggestion I have for parents. If your kid comes to you and says, I don't know how to do this and it's something academic, it is okay if the answer to that is ask your teacher. <laughs> You don't have to answer it. You don't have to be your child's teacher. They have teachers. So the answer could be ask your teacher. Yep, and we had a comment come in, don't hold their hand. So in, in quotes, so just to be specific and absolutely. Awesome. So I think as of now that wraps up our questions. So one of the things I wanna do is advance the slides and just talk very briefly about some of the additional resources that I listed here. Um, I found something really cool. For all those of you that are um, high school or college age learners that wanna learn more about how to deal with this executive function issues and how to become better independent learners, I found a great website. It's called beyondbooksmart.com. This company does offer um, uh, professional coaching services that are fee-based, but in addition to the fee-based coaching, they have a huge range of really helpful um, uh, free uh, webinars and videos that you can watch that have lots of great tips about improving your executive function skills. Uh, another one also uh, is this blog, Successful Online Learning. There's tons and tons of really good stuff on that website. So if you're so inclined and want to learn more how, about how to become a more effective independent learner, go to these two places. And the next one, supplemental reading and resources on the various learning platforms. Um, you might run into, you, you might become a more effective learner by becoming a more effective user of the online platforms that you are utilizing. So I've just listed uh, the help centers. Uh, most of these companies charge schools an arm and a leg for access to this software. So as part of the charge to the school, many of them have really, really good IT support and help centers and people to help you problem solve and, and learn how to be a better user of their platforms. Next. And I talked about enrichment activities. Art, um, there's some really cool stuff on Google Arts and Culture. Google Arts and Culture has free online virtual tours of museums all over the world. And some of the stuff is really, really cool. And there's this cool website called Board Teachers. And they have, among other things, these professional educators um, have listed 50 online art and music resources and they're um, broken up into age appropriate groups. So there's some, some stuff that's appropriate for elementary, middle school and high school and beyond. So there's some really cool stuff on all these websites. So I just thought I would take a minute um, to point you in the direction of, of poking around on some of those websites when you have a minute. Awesome. And we actually did get one more question. So if you don't mind, we can just throw it out there now. Um, what is your advice for incoming college students with the current situation and how most classes might end up being online? Um, going off to college is a really exciting time. Um, and I think a lot of people are really worried about how different it's going to be if they start online instead of in person. And right before I did this uh, webinar this evening, the last hour of my day in the work day was I did an online Zoom question and answer period for 90 parents of incoming students at Hofstra that are starting as freshmen next fall who all had the same worries and the same issues and the same questions. Um, and trust me, it's not going to be the same 
but it's still going to be engaging and exciting. And what I want you to do to be prepared for that is first, just like all colleges are doing, we are preparing for two different contingencies. We are preparing to welcome our students on campus in August. And we are preparing for what we would do if we can't physically welcome them on campus. We're, we're, we're getting ready for both possibilities. So you too have to get ready for both possibilities. One of the things you want to think about is if I am going to a college campus, what do I need to bring with me? What are the things I want to have in my room? How do I want to set up my room? What, you know, what are the, the, the possessions that I want to have with me to make me feel like I'm at home? You also need to be prepared, be preparing yourself. And, and actually online learning is a good precursor for this because in high school, most of your learning is done in the school setting. When you go to college, most of your learning is not done in class. Most of your learning is done outside of class independently on your own by reading and studying and researching and doing uh, work by yourself. So actually, the experience that you're having right now is outstanding practice for what it's going to be like when you go to college. And you know what? It's still going to be awesome. It's still going to be exciting. It's still going to be another step in your independence, regardless of whether or not you're physically, you know, um, physically on a campus or not. Great, great question. Great answer. Um, so we have come to our allotted time for this webinar. So just some things for follow up. You will all be getting a recording of this webinar tomorrow via email. And I do ask that, you know, you share this within your networks. It will be available. Um, the question and answer, the resources that Julie spoke about will all be available at the Spina Bifida Association COVID-19 page where the link is right there. If you do have additional questions that come up and you would like an answer to them, you can email sbaa at sbaa.org and include the subject line online learning in high school and college. And we will get back to you with a response. And um, if you want to talk to me, you will be given the information of how to get in touch with me. I'd be more than happy to engage further with any of you. Wonderful, wonderful. So thank you all for joining. Thank you for participating. And I really appreciate you taking time out tonight to be with us. Um, please be safe and have a great rest of your day.